see YouTube. So I thought I'd take you with me a little bit. Um, today is a day of cleanup. It's Friday. And um, one of the things that's nice about having a helper is that the helper can clean up behind you. Uh, you can't get work done that's true work if you have to stop and clean up after yourself. But nonetheless, I have to do that. You can see in the sunlight there is a lot of dust. Um, one of the dustiest times in a house is between the time you put the insulation up and the time you put the trim up because you still have spackling dust all around. Now I've vacuumed this place a bunch of times and all, but there's still dust embedded in the wood grains and the floor and all. And there's spackling remnants that have to be scraped up, but um, <clears throat> we'll do that. We'll clean that up. But the reason that I want to get cleaned up now is because since the trim is pretty much get, you know getting done in this room now, I need to be able to uh, do the finishing of it. Put a little polyurethane on the window sills and touch up, put the fill the nail holes and all. And I want to do that in a clean environment. I don't want dust all over the place. So I'm cleaning up this up now so that the dust, and then I'll be able to shut the door, which will keep the dirt out of this room. So I'm still not done with this room. I have a lot more to do in here. I'm just saying, you know, you want to clean up every now and then. So that's part of what I'm doing at the moment. Okay, so I'm going to start in this room to nail up some um, uh, chair rail molding. And um, the, the hardest part about nailing chair rail up, especially when you're working with short lengths, and uh, if you've been watching my videos, you know I work in 8-footers. Now, the hardest thing about that is the room's wider than 8-foot, so you want to stop the molding with a 45 cut on it, and I'll show you that as I go, on a stud, because you need to have nailing to keep the gap closed. So, what I do is... Uh, you, you don't want to be by a window because windows can be deceiving as far as you know where the studs are because we know that there's a stud there. But in the middle, you can tell by the sound that there's not a stud. So if you listen, you can hear where the stud is. Okay. So what I do is I mark the stud. Now it just so happens that there's a little paint mark there where the stud is. So from one end, it's 11 inches to the first stud. So then from there, it's every 16 inches. Now you can see this stud's far enough, that right here is far enough away from the window that it wouldn't be part of the window studs. So as I tap, you can hear the difference. So what I do is I put a little X there and then I'll come uh, measure 16 inch centers with the tape. Let me just show you. So I have the X over there. And then I'll measure 16 inch centers. But I want to get past the window to make sure that I'm on the studs. Okay, so there's one at 48 right here. So I tap. Sorry about that. And I put a little mark there. Okay, so with knowing where the nails are over there, I'm going to take this piece of molding and I'm going to measure and put a little tick mark where I want the drill marks to be. So there's going to be one at 11, and then from that, it's every 16. Now, if you want to go ahead and add 11 to 16 each time, you can go ahead and do that. What I do is move the tape measure over and just measure every 16. This way I know I'm not wrong and I'm not trying to add things. And you might think, oh, well, you know, somebody doesn't know how to add. I can add very well. That's not the issue. The issue is that I'm almost always distracted from something, whether it's my own thinking or whether it's bullseye down there worrying if he's going to run outside or not. Okay? So, this is what we want to do. Mark all the marks. I have a little tick mark on there, and now I'm going to drill holes where the nails are going to go. So the first one starts at 11 inches out. So we're going to go with that. 
and I've already drilled one within an inch or about an inch away from the end of this molding. Should have been a little bit further. I don't like being that close. Here's my next mark or here. I don't like being that close, but that's where I am. I did that is so that anybody who does who wants to do this work and doesn't have money for an $80 drill every time you need one, this way you already have a way of drilling holes and you can get these push drills for less than 20 bucks and they'll almost last you a lifetime. Okay, so we've nailed up our first piece of um, chair rail molding to separate the paint from the the bottom paint color from the top paint color and this is why being very neat uh, pays off. This is a piece of, this is paint here, it's not um, uh, a pencil line and what aggravates me about it is that it's above my mark, right? there's no way for me to hide it. So that's going to have to be painted over. Now um, since we or I am the finish guy that means that I'm going to have to be the one to finish that. So I've got to get the paint, bring it back over here. But I do all that at the end. I look at every single thing before I leave the room. It's, when I close this door behind me, this door, and I put a, a locked latch, that means that this room is done. And when I say done, it, I defy someone to come and find a mistake. So that's how I treat myself. I've always done that regardless of if, if there's anyone checking me or not. Because it teaches you to be really good at what you do. So anyway, I've got my first piece nailed up there. There's a butt joint at that end, and on this end, there's a 45 cut. Okay, That's because when I bring this board from this way, I'm going to overlap this. And it's also resting right on a stud. So that's going to make it easy for me to nail, easy to put that joint together. And then I'll show you how you go about uh, measuring that and marking that, or at least how I do it. God forbid that I should say, this is how you do it, because I'll have a thousand people complaining. So I'm going to say, this is what I do. And then I'll show you how you do this little piece over in this corner as well. Alright, so for those of you who have never seen this before, I did not cut a 45 on here, and I'm going to explain to you why in a little bit. But first of all, this what I'm putting here is known as a cope joint, okay? And a cope joint is simply, I'm going to cut this face to match the design of this molding. So what I do is, instead of trying to cut the piece and get a measurement, I'll back cut this on a 45, the same 45 you would cut if you were going to miter these corners. Okay, I'm going to cut a 45 on this piece, and then I'm going to cut out that shape that's left. And then I'll bring the molding back, press it in there, and mark it on where to cut it. So I'll show you how you do that. Alright, so I have the miter saw set on a 45 to cut this direction the same miter that I would have cut if I was going to use a miter joint in there. So what I'm going to do is just cut it. Alright, so now what you have there is a perfect outline of what that molding is going to look like. And all you have to do is cut that out and you use a coping saw for that. And once you cut that, that thing will fit perfectly against the other piece as long as you cut it good. So, I have a couple coping saws here. 
coping saws, uh, this is what a coping saw looks like. It's got a very thin blade on it so it's easy to turn. You can adjust it so you can turn in different configurations if you have to. Um, the blade that's in here right now, I have with the teeth facing forward because I usually cut, and so does everybody else, with a forward stroke. But sometimes I change that. It all depends on what I'm cutting and how hard it is. So what you want to do is you're looking at this and you're realizing what you have to cut, okay? So the bottom here gets cut straight off. The bottom gets cut straight off because it's only the thickness of a hair that is actually part of what's happening there, okay? So you start here and then you cut along this line until you get to the top. You want to hold the saw so you're back cutting a little bit. Not a lot, just a little. And you won't see any of that back cut when you're finished. So let's see if I can get you in a position here where I can cut this and you can see this. Alright, so I'm holding the saw in such a way that I'm going to be back cutting. Now, how you cut this, if you can follow all the little curves just to start off, then follow them. But sometimes, especially with different types of wood, it's hard to follow these little turns. So what I'll do then is I'll come out of the cut like this, just so I have a place to start over again. Okay, so I'm just going to shave a little bit of that because I can see the mark. And now I want to cut this little thin here. So then when you go to fit your coat joint, you want to make sure that you're flat against the molding here for one thing. Don't, you, know, you, you don't want the bottom out or the top out, you want to be flat because that's going to mimic the wall. Basically push on that molding, I'm pushing with my stomach here, because if you remember I don't have it nailed tightly yet. So I'm pushing against the wall there. And then I'm going to take and I'm going to mark right here where I want to cut this molding to fit between there and where I'm at. Now if you look, that coat joint is very nice and tight in there. It could have been a little bit better. But there's such a tiny little line in here on the profile that I can barely cut that thing. So I'm sort of bringing it back past that. And that's where I'm ending the cut. The cut should have ended all the way over here, which is about an eighth over. But I still got a nice looking joint and it's not really going to matter. Okay, as long as I cut them all the same way. So I'm going to go cut this and bring it back and show you how... Okay, so the one thing, keep in mind also, that I'm using a file, it's with me all the time, on every edge to make sure that this thing is going to lay nice and flat. And one of the things that I don't think I showed yesterday was this. If you look at this molding, you can see that there's some um, polyurethane on the back of it that ran around. Sometimes that polyurethane can actually hold you from being tight against the wall. Depends on how thick it is. If you take your knife, you can pull that off of there pretty good. Now you don't want to take any wood if you can help it, but at least get the polyurethane off. So then, I'm going to fit this in here. And how you put it in, you need to be careful with this as well. If you um, put this side in and drive that in, sometimes that can work. But you run the risk of tearing out the fibers this direction. And once you tear them out, it's over with. You can't get them back in. You can put this in this way and try and drive it in. But you have to drive it in further than it's going to stay because of the width you have here. So the best thing to do is to just bring it in here nice and slowly. Try to bring it in straight. So then what I'll do then to put that into place is take a piece with another coat joint on it. This is I'm using this as a tool and just tap that in there. Make sure it's flush against. There you 
have your joint. So then one of the more difficult joints, depending upon how you ended up, let's say I ended up with a piece of molding here with a straight face. It's a difficult cut to do a coat joint against that and a 45 miter over here. It requires some good measuring. As long as you measure good, you won't have any trouble. So what I did here, guys, was I ended with a straight cut, and over here is a miter that has closed. You can barely see it, but it's right here. It's closed that gap to make a straight-looking piece. So a coat joint over there, and the mi and the uh, straight cut there. Now that's a reverse miter. This is the one that's on this piece. Now over here, we're going to put a coat joint and run out wherever the eight footer ends on a stud. And I'll cut it. I won't leave the 8 footer hole. I'll cut it so it ends on a stud. Alright guys, what I was saying about the corner here is when you go to fit this last piece of molding, if you notice, it's being held away from the wall here. The reason for that is because the wall's not perfectly straight into the corner. Because there's spackling compound in there, it actually comes on a curve. So you have to allow for that curve. Now how do you do that? Well, what I'm going to do is take and put a chamfer across this back corner, which is going to help this to rest in there better. And the way I'm going to do it, with a utility knife, I'm going to take my knife, like I'm peeling an apple, and I'm going to pull this back corner off of this. Now you don't want to go too big at the top. The bottom, nobody's going to see, but the top, you want to sort of slow it down a little. You should go that direction so you don't um, booger up the wood, split the wood at the end. All right, so now we'll take a look at how that fits. Now see that gets you in there a lot further, but we're still a little bit away here because this is on a taper, so we can take more off of there to get that in there further. Okay guys, so you can see what I've done there. I've taken some wood off the very corner of that, okay, and that's to get that to lay in there nicer. So when I fit that piece in there then, you can see how nice that fits against the wall. Now what's out in here, there's a slight gap out there. It can also be made to go closer that way if you trim some of this off. I'm not interested in that because my coke joint's going to hide that. So that's how you get the molding to get a lot nicer fit because the corner of the drywall is not square, it's rounded. And then at this end, just move over here. At this end we have the reverse part of this miter. Now this has to be picked up and nailed, but it'll be nailed right there and then that'll be tight. When you're measuring for these the miter uh, joint that's here, what you want to do is get your measurement from inside the wall here, inside the corner or you can get it slightly away from the corner, it doesn't matter, somewhere in this area. Measure from here to the furthest part of the cut on the 45, which would be this piece. If this molding had a rounder edge and the miter was back in here, wherever the furthest edge is, is what you measure to. So that's right there. So in other words, when I go to cut this, I measure from the straight end, okay, from the straight end, all the way to the very tip for this measurement was 35 and 1 16th. So that's what I want that to be. But I have to remember now, you see my pencil line here, to bring that up to that pencil line to be where it's supposed to be at. You know, the biggest thing about uh, wood that a lot of people don't understand is that wood is not straight. It bends, it warps, it twists. There are very few boards that are straight. 
and you need to know how to work with them. And what I'm showing you here about push, pushing and pulling and adjusting is how you work with wood. I see a nice fit there once nailed. So that trim really dresses this room up then. And um, I thought we had wallpaper border for that, but my wife and I were thinking about a different house that we had. So that's what we thought we had. Now you could do all kinds of things with this type of thing. I'm just trying to do it traditional. <laughs> you could <coughs> put a wide board behind that. You could put a shelf on the top of that. You could do all kinds of things if you wanted to. But for now, this is what we're doing. Okay, guys, so what we have now here is we're going to nail up the piece of molding between the door jams. Now, it's, it's 90 and... What was it? Uh, 9 sixteenths, I believe. So that's less than a foot, yeah. 99.16. So I'm going to be able to cut that and fit that in there. Now there's times when you do molding work where you want what's known as a crush fit, like possibly over in this corner or certain corners, certain places. But one thing about a crush fit, when you're between two doors, I'm about as far back as I can get here. There you go. When you're between when you're two, between two doors like this, you know, you want to be careful that you cut the molding that it fits exact. Because if the molding's a little long and you pull on it to fit it, and then you push it in and it's so tight that it pushes the door jams, it's possible that you're going to screw up the jam and it won't be able to close the door. Now I know we used eight penny nails in there and everything, and that should hold it, but you don't want to push on these door jams. You want them to stay straight. So, um, and pushing on the molding would push on the jam. So what you want to do is just get a good measurement and cut that just right. Now I've already marked my 37 inches off the floor for these. And, and by the way, when you mark your 37 or whatever you're going to do to set the height, make sure you check that gap between the bottom of the window and that. Because if that's crooked, that's going to look like heck in case you followed something with the window. So you want to keep that straight so that it looks straight underneath the windows. Okay, so we're going to go and cut this piece and then we're going to nail that up. Thank goodness it's two straight cuts. So there we go guys, a nice looking piece of chair rail. And naturally everything depends on a person's taste. I like the fine lines I have here. Got a finished one piece here yet. But I like the way it looks with the window sills. And I was just talking to my wife a little bit ago about the uh, color carpeting and uh, what she thinks would go well in here. Because I don't profess to be good with colors. I never did. I, I don't. I don't recommend colors either. But um, anyway, got to put the base molding in here and the crown molding next.